Aloha, welcome to a new season and a sustainability campus community dialogue. And it's now October, it's an exciting beginning of the semester. Of course, September is an exciting time. It's really the Super Bowl or World Cup of global diplomacy with the UN General Assembly kicking off. But also another exciting aspect of global diplomacy is the UN Human Rights Council, which always begins in September. And this season we begin with a new High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet. But not only are things happening around the world, but also here at home in Hawaii. And so we're very fortunate to be able to be looking here at the first side. Here is a brand new article that just came out yesterday in the Sunday paper, looking at rising sea level change against the tide. And it has our own chairman of the Honolulu Climate Change Commission, as well as vice chairman writing an article about what we need to look at regarding high tide flooding by mid-century, and also a, a planning piece by former uh, Professor Kent Lowry looking at climate change adaptation. But we're also very fortunate to have Greenpeace with us here. And the Arctic sunrise just came into port near Aloha Tower, and it'll be here for actually up until October 29th. But in between then, they'll be leaving Honolulu, going to Maui, and then also going to Koholawe. And we're very excited to have Greenpeace here. We'd like to welcome them, and it's great to host you. And I'd like to welcome Natalie from Greenpeace. We'll be able to share with you a bit about the work that they're doing on the plastic campaign and what they're focusing on. And we'll also be able to show some short videos about some of the important work that Greenpeace is doing here in Hawaii. So I'll hand it over to Natalie. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Can people hear me? Can I get a thumbs up? She's giving you a thumbs up. Yes, great. Yay, <laughs> amazing. All right, aloha and hello. My name is Natalie Nava, and I am on the plastics team with Greenpeace USA. I am based in Oakland, California, and I am really excited to be here today. I have been living and working on the Arctic Sunrise ship for four days since it came into port here, so it's really nice to be on land <laughs> and here with you all. So I'm here today to talk to you all about plastics. Uh, what the problem is with plastics, and then a bit about Greenpeace USA's perspective on what the solution is to our plastic pollution crisis. So I'm going to start with just a couple questions. So let me see the show of hands. How many people out there try to recycle whenever they can? Awesome. How many people have a reusable bag or reusable water bottle and try to bring that with you wherever you go? Yay, great. But how many people are still seeing plastic pollution, whether it's at your local beach, uh, your, you know, other place in your community? I know I do. Everywhere. Yes, it's everywhere. And that really right there is the problem. So we have been told for so long that as long as we recycle, as long as we bring our usable bags to the grocery store, everything is going to be just fine. But unfortunately, this is really just a corporate narrative that companies push onto us that keeps us in the dark about what happens to our plastics when we throw them away, and really just how extensive the plastic pollution crisis really is. Because what happens when we throw something away? The vast majority of the plastics that we're dutifully tossing into the recycling bin uh, don't actually get recycled. We know now that only 9% of all of the plastics that have been produced since the beginning of time have been recycled. That's a pretty, it's a pretty staggering number. So the truth is that we just don't actually have the technology or infrastructure necessary to deal with a lot of this stuff. So a lot of the recyclables that are produced on mainland uh, United States get exported to Asia. I was talking to someone this weekend who said that uh, recyclables produced and thrown away in Hawaii will, will get shipped to the mainland. Uh, so we're sending this stuff to countries that really just, again, don't have the infrastructure to handle a lot of this. China, I think, earlier this year said they don't want to, they don't want to uh, receive our trash anymore. They now have a foreign waste ban. So instead of shipping it to China, now we're shipping it to countries in Southeast Asia. So we're really just, we're sending our stuff all over the world. So if this, if our plastics aren't getting recycled, what is happening to them? It's ending up in our landfills, it's ending up in incinerators where it's being burned, or it's ending up out polluting our environment, particularly our oceans. We know now that the equivalent of a garbage truckload of plastic is entering our oceans every single minute. So this session is going to be about an hour, so that is the equivalent of 
60 garbage truckloads of plastic entering our ocean just in the time that we're sitting here together. So let that sink in. That's a very, very staggering figure. It's clear that no matter how much we recycle, plastic pollution is going to remain until companies just stop producing so much of it. The Hawaiian Islands are especially hard hit by plastic pollution because it moves across the Pacific Ocean and it washes up uh, onto the shores here in these islands. So Greenpeace just worked with a group of organizations in a coalition called Break Free from Plastic and together we conducted 239 beach cleanups in 42 countries around the world. That's on six continents. And we did these beach cleanups with a really important twist. We not only cleaned up what we found on these beaches and in these communities, but we documented the brands whose plastic packaging we found polluting these places all over the world. Does anybody have a guess who the worst corporate polluter was? What do you think, Joshua? You want to take a guess? I'd say it could be U.S. or China-based corporation. Yeah, what do you think? Which, co which company? Probably one of the big ones, Procter Gamble, one of the... Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola. Procter Gamble was up there. Coca-Cola was number one. How about number two? What do you think? Coca-Cola have to be Pepsi? Exactly. <laughs> Pepsi's number two and Nestle was number three. So the companies that you would expect, we found their products polluting beaches all over the world. But the problem is more than the plastic that we can see on our shores and on our beaches. It's also the plastic that's in the ocean. So we just sent a crew out on an expedition through the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Uh, they just got back uh, about a week ago. And there they were bearing witness to the impact of plastic pollution on our remote oceans and also collecting data on the types of plastic they found out there. So what exactly is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? Well, in our oceans are five gyres uh, where ocean currents cause debris and pollution to collect. So there's two in the Pacific Ocean, there's two in the Atlantic Ocean, and there's one in the Indian Ocean. Um, I have a video that I'm going to show you all about the top five myths of the garbage patch because let me tell you, the crew was really surprised about what they found out there. Um, and it, the garbage patch just, just wasn't what we thought it was. So let's show this video and show folks the top five myths. That sounds great. And I think it's great how you also added the brand on it because I think individuals yes. have been taking action for a long time, but we also have to look at corporate responsibility as well. Absolutely. And we're going to talk more about that, so thank you, Joshua. Five myths about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Myth number one, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is a solid island of plastic. In reality, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is actually a soupy mix of plastics and microplastics. These tiny microplastics will never go away. And right now, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is twice the size of Texas. Myth number two, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch isn't a problem because it's in the middle of nowhere. The truth is, microplastics are everywhere. They're even in the food we eat. Myth number three, recycling will solve the plastic pollution crisis. Unfortunately, only 9% of all plastics ever created have been recycled, and plastic production is set to quadruple by 2050. Myth number four, we can simply clean up the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. In reality, microplastics are too small and too widespread to simply clean up. Myth number five, we're completely f***ed. Fortunately, we can still stop plastic pollution at its source. We can demand corporations find alternatives to single-use plastics. Join us in fighting plastic pollution by signing this petition today. All right. Awesome. Excellent one. So the crew out there at the Great Pacific Garbage Patch showed us that uh, it really is not just this big, hunkering, solid, floating island of trash that you can see from space and you can step on. No, it's really mostly these tiny, tiny pieces of plastic because, as David was saying in the video, plastic really never goes away. It just breaks down continuously into these tiny, tiny pieces from exposure to sunlight and wind and water. So the crew collected, uh, brought on board almost 5,000 of these small pieces of plastic, uh, but they told me that they observed, you know, thousands more pieces that were smaller than a grain of sand, so, so small that they, they couldn't even collect it. You know, their, the filter was just, the holes were too large to, to bring all that stuff on board. 
So a lot of people have been asking, you know, were we out in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch to clean it up? But when you really look at just how tiny these pieces are, it becomes clear that it's really going to be pretty impossible to clean this stuff up. Also, only about 1% of the plastics uh, in the ocean exist at the surface. Really, the vast majority uh, are sinking down to the bottom. So it's just so expensive to get down there and really recover this stuff once it's in the ocean uh, to clean it up. Uh, cleanup proposals also fail, into account, fail to take into account uh, all the wildlife that have basically made their home out of plastic. So the crew pulled out a lot of big nets. They were pulling out, you know, shampoo bottles, water bottles that had broken down and found a lot of just little barnacles. Fish and crabs that had, had made their home in this plastic have just attached themselves to it. So if we clean up all this plastic, what's going to happen to all this wildlife that have made their home out of this toxic ecosystem? Another problem with these tiny bits of plastic that are in the ocean is that it looks like food to creatures, and it also smells like food. So uh, when marine wildlife are trying to get food uh, to feed themselves and feed their babies, they are eating plastic. And if you eat fish, you are eating plastic too, unfortunately, which is pretty gross. Everything from tap water to beer to sea salt to even the air we breathe uh, has been shown to now have plastic in it. So again, we really have created just a very toxic ecosystem. And it remains to be seen just what the health impacts are going to be on our bodies in the long term. Uh, we're talking about climate change also as part of this talk. So what's the connection between plastics and climate change? So right now, oil is pretty cheap. And the industry has said that they are planning on quadrupling the production of plastics by 2050. So a lot of this stuff is just going just gonna to keep uh, being produced without any significant intervention from us. It's been shown that plastics emit greenhouse gases when they break down. So again, there really is no away. When this stuff's breaking down, it is releasing greenhouse gases into the air that are committing to contributing to climate change. And it's really just one big cycle of the fossil fuel industry and what happens on the other side. So why don't we show another one of our videos? That sounds good. <laughs> and it definitely fits in with the recent report released by the IPCC at the UN on its 30th anniversary. So we'll show the story of a spoon. Awesome. That's what I think. Five like. billion years ago, a giant molecular cloud collapses in space, setting free a solar nebula out of which a planet is born, Earth. For two billion years, this planet evolves and first life appears. A soup of cells, bacteria, algae, fungi, a myriad of plants come to life. Fish rain the oceans and eat the algae. They absorb the sunlight and store it in their bodies. Dinosaurs, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, they all live and die. And each year, their dead bodies are covered by layers and layers of sediment. Heat and pressure rise, turning them into yellow-black liquid, oil. Humans arrive, and with them, geologists. They study for years to find the oil and build rigs in remote places. Giant pumps extract the liquid, and it's shipped across the oceans. A refinery now cracks it open, and once again it travels. A factory then binds the compounds and turns them into plastic pellets. Stored in big containers around the world they go. Liquefied, they're molded into the shape of a beautiful spoon. The spoon drops and cools off to harden. Wrapped in plastic, it is put into a box, and the box is put on a pallet, and the pallet is put into a container, and the container is put on a truck, and the truck drives to a port, where the container is put on a ship, and ship, 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 the spoon arrives 6,000 kilometers around the world, where it is picked up by a merchant who puts it on a truck and drives it to a store, where it's placed on a shelf in a temperature-controlled room, where it sits for two months until you select it and pay for it with the money you've worked hard for, and you drive the spoon home, which is where you are standing right now with the spoon in your hand. Now tell me, do you still think it's too much effort to use a metal spoon that you just have to wash? Wow, the story of spoon. Story of spoon. So the fossil fuel industry and the plastics industry are really inextricably linked. So. If we solve the plastic crisis, we will definitely move towards what we need to do to solve the climate crisis and vice versa. So these things are really, really linked. So I just want to emphasize that plastic is a, a very complicated problem. Uh, there isn't just a silver bullet or one clear solution right now. It's, it's really convenient for all of us to think that more recycling is going to solve it 
you know, or cleaning up the ocean. Uh, but we really need to just confront these convenient ideas that we have because, again, it just these myths make it very convenient for the companies who are profiting off of all this plastic to just keep doing what they're doing, keep business as usual, and consumers feel like, well, the problem is on me, and I just need to recycle more, and that will solve everything. So we at Greenpeace are really building a movement of people around the country and around the world who are holding these companies accountable. So we're asking for real solutions, more than just recycling, more than just swapping out one throwaway material for another, right? A lot of people talk about uh, biodegradable plastics, and mm -hmm. isn't that great? Um, the problem with biodegradable plastics is that they require uh, being, again, appropriately collected and appropriately put in a facility that can heat to uh, more than 100 degrees to break down. Yeah. So when I was in San Diego, I was talking to a supporter who said, I really wanted to compost my one of those green bio bags in right. my backyard. So he buried it up. A year later, he dug it up, and what do you think he found? It was shiny and new. The logo was still on it and everything. So these things uh, really act just like plastics when we throw them away yeah. uh, into our environment. They, they act like plastics when they enter the ocean. They require a special facility to really break down. So again, we just really need to think about uh, these quick fixes, these simple solutions, and kind of go beyond and ask the question of, you know, is this really the change that we need, or do we need something more drastic? It's really going to require a fundamental shift in the way that we purchase and consume things. Right now, it's pretty much impossible to get through the day without plastic, right? This stuff is everywhere. I went to print something out today, and I wanted to get a folder, and I had to buy a plastic folder because there's just no other option. Wow. <laughs> and avoiding plastic uh, can mean really going out of your way. It can mean spending extra time, spending extra money, and that's just a luxury that not all of us have, unfortunately. So um, much of what we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis we call single-use plastic. These are things that are designed to be used for just a couple minutes before we throw them away. So these are things like chip bags, plastic water bottles, plastic bags, things like that. Again, uh, really designed to be used just for a few minutes before we throw them away and before they end up polluting our environment for yeah. hundreds and hundreds of years. But it really doesn't have to be this way. I personally am not old enough to remember jars of milk uh, being delivered in glass, but I've heard stories about that. So there was a time when we weren't so reliant on plastic and we didn't see it just everywhere, everywhere we go. So we really need to get back to that. Um, we are asking that the companies who have billions of dollars to invest on innovation really figure out some appropriate solutions for us. That could mean you know, bulk delivery systems. It could mean scaling up some of the technologies that people around the world are developing. Um, we at Greenpeace aren't saying, you know, this particular material or this particular system is the solution because, again, we really think that the companies who are just making a profit off of all this plastic be the ones to take it upon themselves, invest the money, invest the time into creating appropriate solutions. Uh, maybe we should say our last, last video. Yeah, sure. It's a good time. So here's a good one to look at and very important issue. There's a lot of things that we can do to re reduce 
plastic in our own life, right? We can bring our own straw, we can bring our own grocery bag, all these things, but it's just so important that we start thinking about, again, how we're holding the corporations accountable for this crisis. So one thing that you can do to take action with Greenpeace right now is pull out your cell phone, your smartphone. You have a tool for activism right in your pocket. You can text the words plastic free, that's two words, to the number 877-877. Again, that is texting plastic free, two words, to 877-877. And that will take you to one of our petitions. Uh, it's a petition for the seven really large companies, right? The Cokes, Nestle, Starbucks, McDonald's, and a few others. To those CEOs, asking them again to really stop producing so much of this single-use plastic and invest in solutions. A lot of people think, you know, when I sign a petition online, it doesn't go anywhere. I'm really not doing very much. But when you take action with Greenpeace, we really do send these petitions to the CEOs of companies. We are very proud that we have such a strong legacy of holding companies accountable and asking them to do the right thing. And adding your voice really does uh, add you to a list of hundreds of thousands of people who want to see change on this issue. And it really does give us leverage when it's time for us to put pressure on these companies. So can I take questions? Is there, is there a way for me to take sure. any questions? Sure. Yeah, you, do you have a question that you'd like to ask initially? You just hit the button on the speaker in front of you. And it'll send you live Hello? and we can talk to you right away. Yep. Yes. Is it working? Is it awesome? <gasps> yes. Yep. Um, <laughs> are there any countries that have like successfully, or not successfully, but kind of took a step forward in recycling like more than at least 9% or like who are in the works of actually having their government take part in the whole um, plastic? Yeah, that's a... That's a really good question. So a lot of European countries are far ahead of the United States, I would say, in this in tackling this crisis. So yeah. some European countries have started to create grocery stores where um, it's all bulk delivery, you know, plastic-free grocery stores. A lot of European countries are, have been successful um, putting pressure on, you know, their governments and, again, just on their local retailers to do that. But really, a lot of countries around the world, we're seeing more plastic bag bans, uh, you know, again, foreign waste bans. Everything good? <laughs> yeah, even, even, countries like, even countries like China and India are now saying, you know, they're setting goals for phasing out plastic bags and things like that. So um, one of the things that I hear from supporters sometimes is, well, you know, I'm throwing everything away in my recycling bin, and this stuff is just, it's all coming from Asia. It's all Asia's fault. But it really is a global problem. Um, plastic, once it gets in the ocean, can travel thousands of miles from where it was thrown away and, again, end up on a beach thousands of miles from where it was thrown away. So. This stuff is affecting all of us. It's polluting the environment for all of us, polluting the ocean for all of us. So um, yeah, those kinds of things are really important. Uh, working with, you know, putting pressure on local grocery stores, local legislation. So yeah, we are, we are seeing this kind of action all around the world. In the US, there's a lot of straw bans. Straws yep. have become like the poster child for plastics. Um, straws, you know, straws aren't the problem in and of themselves, but it really gets us to start thinking about okay, do I really need this plastic straw that I'm going to use for two seconds? It really starts gets, gets us thinking about kind of breaking free from all of the plastic that we're using day in, day out, constantly. I think with the straw, the important point was everyone puts them in without even asking. Absolutely. So you actually have to take the step forward and say, we please don't put a straw in. So it's, yeah. it is breaking free and even getting, in that case, the industry. And that's one of the exciting aspects of your visit is, Hawaiian Institute for Human Rights, Plastic Free Hawaii, Surfrider Foundation, a lot of nonprofits in Hawaii all came together and are partnering with Greenpeace then to amplify what we can do in Hawaii even after the boat leaves on October 29th. Yeah, so definitely. What we're looking at is we're inviting uh, senators uh, who proposed having the UN Sustainable Development Goals incorporated into Hawaii law, as well as the senators who focus on water and land and resources, the heads of those committees, to then look at some potential 
full plastic bans, as well as building on the successes of the other counties. So I know you're going to Maui County, and they've had some success in banning awesome. as well. So it's exciting to partner at the global level, knowing that it is a global problem and it'll require all of us to take action, but then also to take action specifically here in Hawaii to see how people can mobilize. And you do see more straws. You see the metal straws. I always yes. have mine whenever we go out. And it's also good to see everybody taking the small steps. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, it's one straw today and then hopefully one spoon and then Definitely. all the other aspects mm -hmm. to make those links. I went to get boba uh, near where, oh. where the ship is. <laughs> boba <done>. is nightmare. <laughs> No, the place where I went they to get got boba big straw? had a metal, big straw? a metal boba pokey straw that, is that the we all best. got for two dollars, right? So, yes. <laughs> so right, I like I like what you said about just all these little actions. So it is, it really is a movement right now. So we call it kind of uh, distributed campaigning, just meaning that we want our supporters, we want people all around the world to to take this and run with it and really put pressure on their local governments. Again, you know, local grocery stores, all the places where they're interacting with plastic in their daily life because it really is going to take everybody. It's going to take a cultural shift. So it's just so important. All these little things, like you're saying, it really, really does add up to changing the mindset and eventually changing how companies and how policy work. So it's very important. Definitely is the consciousness that we have to... Yeah. Established. Absolutely. And that's one of the great things about Greenpeace. It's always a direct action that then makes us think about how we're living and think of the larger pieces in the puzzle. Thank you. Do you have any, any other questions? Yes, I do. Um, how do you feel about um, Hawaii's ban on uh, plastic bags? Because um, I feel like it's still not enough. Because they say, you know, they ban plastics, but then you can still purchase them for 15 cents. But every time I see it, they could, they could just push for a full ban on plastics because at least, like, people would spend, if people buy, let's see, um, the reusable bag, it's only, like, a dollar at the cheapest. But, if, um, but I also still see people paying, like, 15 cents per plastic bag that's, like, available. But every time I see it, um, eight of those plastics bags would equal to one reusable bag. So I feel like maybe they should just start pushing for people to just go full out um, on banning plastic and just buying the reusable bags. Because in the end, they're still spending as much money for a reusable bag as um, the 15 cents accumulate. So does the local government, um, do they have any plans for like, full-on banning plastic bags? Because like they say they did, but then it's still there. You just have to pay 15 cents. You right. Know? It's like, yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think something like this, a plastic bag ban where, you know, plastic's still available, you just have to pay a little more. It's a great place to stop, to start, but a terrible place to stop, right? So we really need to, again, pe give people an option. Sometimes it's giving people no options. Sometimes it's just taking the plastic away entirely and just saying, yeah, we have to bring our reusable bag. Again, really just shifting the way that we go shopping, things like that. Um, what do you think, Joshua? What do you think about this? I this think there's man? important issues that were brought up. I think the point that you raised, Sarah, was good about ecology and economy. Mm -hmm. And for, unfortunately, many Americans who also want to have everything conveniently, but then also are pretty cheap and don't think it should cost, Right. The the bag cost does shift it a little. But I think what Sihar is saying is actually the, is absolutely essential. We have to really, you can't legislate it all. We have to get people to care. And I think that's where Hawaii could lead the way because we're closer to nature than many. Yes. A lot of people never go swimming every day. A lot of people aren't in nature and surrounded by it. And that's still the beauty of Hawaii, even though we do have a lot of the development. If you go 15 minutes into mm -hmm. the mountains or 15 minutes on the coastline, it would just be you. And so I think in Hawaii, we can have that consciousness. And I think what you're calling for, Sierra, isn't that outlandish. In fact, anyone who's spent their time growing up, the kids know that when they're growing up. And maybe you could share a little bit with all the people who came on board and their perspective. Because I know I was there last night on the boat. And the, one of the things that touched me the most was the sweetest little picture drawn with the rainbow and then the Arctic Sunrise boat at the bottom from obviously someone who was touched by their visit there. And it was also a pink piece of paper in the strategy room. And maybe you could say a little bit about because I know you worked so hard this weekend meeting so many people from Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And when Greenpeace comes into port, everybody wants to come and see. So maybe are there any story or any aspect about 
that that you can share where you can see people either having that innate connection. It's also something that we look at in our class. We have a great book called Future Primal and a lot of the other books we have that look at a lot going on at the UN that it has to be in our consciousness and then we have to have social change really in ourselves like at the mm -hmm. inner level then at the island level but then like you yes. said only through international solidarity will there be true social change where we can't protect our planet before it's too late and I think maybe you could share about that and then that also leads us to the IPCC report because mm -hmm. the IPCC report says basically we have a dozen years we have 12 years yes. till what happened last week in the panhandle of Florida is a more recent occurrence and all the things that people are facing now with Puerto Rico one year ago with Maria mm -hmm. so our window is getting smaller and smaller so we have to influence corporations to take actions but it does start with individuals and I know you got to meet a lot of people from Hawaii that came to yes. the boat. I have to say the supporters that I met this past weekend from Hawaii were the most excited supporters I've ever met. They were so excited to come on the boat, so excited to be part of Greenpeace. They're like, can I go with you to Kaholabe? Can I sit say Like, how do I do this? They were just so, so excited. And so at, during the tours, we talked to people about plastic pollution this past weekend. Um, a lot of folks, when they're about to come on board, they're like, oh yeah, you know, cleaning it up and, and these kinds of things. And through the journey of the tour, you know, we show them actually a lot of the plastic that we collected when we were in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. We have a lot of broken down pieces of debris. Uh, we have a jar filled with these tiny pieces of plastic that I was talking about. We show them a Coca-Cola bottle that we found in the garbage patch. Um, it was very difficult to recover that apparently. Uh, you know, out in, out in the waters it's extremely turbulent and someone spotted the bottle and it was just like a mad dash to get it. They're like, confirmed, it's a Coke bottle. So <laughs> it was, you know, they're, the crew's like, that's, that's, they're just so proud they got the bottle. And when people really see that, it really starts to sink in like, oh my God, this, this uh, Coca-Cola bottle is from, was produced in China. You know, it was found thousands of miles away um, when it was recovered. It, that bottle was produced thousands of miles away. We have no idea the journey that it took to get there. And so, Seeing, seeing that for people, when people see, oh my God, these big pieces of plastic actually break down into these tiny bits, it really starts to sink in for them that there really just isn't that easy solution. And so when they get off the ship, they're, they're so excited to take action. And I think they really start to understand because, again, there's just so many stories that we've been told for so long that, you know, again, recycling and cleaning it up and just these very convenient things. Um, and it can be really difficult, emotionally difficult to confront these stories, to confront these realities. But... I think just getting up close and personal um, really does make a difference. So again, I mean, folks here are so connected with, with their beach and the ocean, and they just care so much about it. And, um, you know, when we tell folks that the ship's going to Kaholabe, they're like, oh, my God, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a very important place for folks. And uh, I think on, on the mainland, people are just a lot more disconnected. So we have to kind of think about how we really get people more invested in their community, their natural habitat too. It's, it's all part of one big mindset shift. You know, these things are all so connected. So thinking about how we really bring, bring the issues closer to people and, and connect, help them connect better with their, their own environment, their personal environment. No, very true. And I mean, I think the exciting part about Greenpeace going there and spending those days is the plastic gyre is just, in so many ways, no one knows what it is and no one knows right. where it all goes. And even thinking of that one story of that Coke bottle in China, we just don't make the connection that, oh, it'll be fine, it'll be right. going. And the truth is, we just don't know. So it's, I think the story of the spoon video was good because it shows how much travel goes and all that's fossil fuel travel. Yeah. And then more importantly though, but how with our single action, with simple solidarity about the planet and people around the planet that we can stop that. Mm -hmm. and I know uh, Plastic Free Hawaii is doing a great job giving out the, the uh, bamboo spoons. Yes, I have mine. I carry that everywhere around the world. Great. And <laughs> I know people just look like, are you kidding me? And you're like, that's what <laughs> no. one people can do, you know? So yes. there's a great indigenous story about the hummingbird that tried to put out the great mm. fire. And I know where you're at in California, there's many fires. And he was like, they're like, what is a hummingbird doing just dropping water by himself? And he's like, doing my part. So it yeah. has to start with that. Yeah. But I think what Greenpeace does is generates also the power of the people to be able to hold corporations accountable. And then really that's 
part of the distributive campaign. We got to get people Absolutely. to change the way we consume. And also, if corporations see us just as consumers and governments just see us as voters and citizens, we are, you know, conscious beings that also have a bigger desire and a bigger picture of mm -hmm. the world, which was also brought up in the Spoon video with the erupting uh, evolution of the cosmos. And so I think we need to story tell our way into what's most important for us and then mm -hmm. find ways to make that action. Absolutely. Yeah, we're going against, you know, the, some of the biggest companies in the world, right? Coca-Cola. These companies have billions to invest in everything, advertising. So I feel like so much of what I do in my work is advertising. You know, it's really figuring out, again, yeah, how to tell the story, how I get people excited, you know, how can our campaign show up in a way that really gets people to understand the issue and take action. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we're doing as best we can with our resources going up against these huge multinational companies. So, yeah, it really is going to take everybody. Absolutely. And I think also there was a conference at the UN as well that's looking at uh, Law of the Sea and the mm. next level beyond the national boundaries. Mm -hmm. So it's beyond mm -hmm. boundaries. And it's looking at marine protected areas and other issues. And that just happened right before the Human Rights Council session, as well as right before the UN General Assembly. So this, there's also a new piece of global legislation that's looking at beyond boundaries, that's looking at protecting our oceans that way. And I know Very they're cool. trying to hold corporations accountable in that way as well. Awesome. All right, Sarah, is there any one last question? Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, Perfect. So that's is what it safe? Are. Thank you. Um, is it safer to drink um, bottled water or like filtered tap water? Because um, from the presentation, you said that there are some traces of plastic in our tap water. Because recently, I just bought like this, um, the Brita filter thingy, so I can just um, start filtering our tap water. But then, is it still safer to still buy bottled water over filtered tap water if you, have, if you buy like or invest in those um, tap water filters and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Thank Excellent. you. Yeah. That's a really good question. So you're right. I mentioned that plastic traces have been found in tap water, but plastic traces are also found in bottled water. So same. it's it's really the same. I mean, <laughs> the the plastic that's pr that holds our bottled water, packaged bottled water is pretty cheap. Um, I'm putting together, you know, an emergency kit because of course I live in California. There is earthquakes. And one of the things that someone told me was, you know, you can't, you can't just buy one of those big plastic water bottles and that will keep forever. That's going to, eventually, it's just going to completely break down. So plastic is constantly breaking down um, from exposure, again, to sun and wind and water. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, I mean, again, we've just really created a toxic environment. This stuff is everywhere. It is really tough to avoid. Um, I was talking to somebody yesterday who came on a tour on the ship because we were telling him, you know, I forget the exact stat, it was like 33 out of 36 salt brands, you know, have plastic. He's like, well, but which ones, which ones don't? And it's like, unfortunately, we're really, we're consuming this stuff. If we're drinking water, if we're eating, um, you know, things that really get into our oceans are now just a fundamental part of the environment. They become a fundamental part of who we are. We just can't separate ourselves from that. So. One of the things that we like to say at Greenpeace is, if you walked into your house and your house was flooding, you wouldn't immediately reach for a mop. You would find the sink that was overflowing and you would turn that off first. So uh, the reality is we just, we can't do a whole lot about the plastic that is already in our oceans today. It is gonna be extremely expensive and require you know a lot of thinking to clean that up, if it's even possible. We don't really think it's possible, but we really need to look at uh, cutting this stuff off at the source because right now there is just, again, every minute of every day, all year long, a garbage truckload of plastic is getting into our ocean. So if we start to clean it up, we're just we're just never going to outrun the problem. We have to really cut this thing off at the source, and demand that companies just stop producing so much of this of this single use plastic. So, no, I think it's a really good point, and it's it's that health is a human right. And that's getting mm -hmm. to your point. You're trying to make the right decision. Right. And an right. interesting note, though, Aquafina, which almost is a bad translation of the end of water, you know, in a way, mm. their water isn't any better than the water, especially from Hawaii. So there's a lot of really good research. Plastic Free Hawaiian Duration did some really good work. And she spoke to our summer academy where we look at all the 17 goals. And we looked at goal number six on clean water. And 
the water we have in Hawaii, because of the natural filter of the volcano, is actually just as clean, if not better. And in, on mm -hmm. some of the bottles, we're higher. So we have a much cleaner, healthier water than even the ones that you buy bottle. It's just marketing and advertising, as right. you pointed right. out. So they've told us it's great. Now, I mean, right. I'm not saying things are bad. I've had Avion water from the source when we're in Geneva, right. and obviously that's straight from the <laughs> glacier, and that's good. But in Hawaii, we are fortunate that we do have cleaner water. So when we even think that we would buy water and it would be better for us, it just shows how powerful right. companies are to change our minds and, and make us think, oh, if we're paying for it, then it's, it's cleaner and better. But the truth is, just because it has the ad slapped on it, it is actually not even on a yeah. health level better. And also, I think, I think about it too, when you said the garbage truck, that's Garbage stunned. truck, right? Right. It's a lot. And I was just at the last beach cleanup, and we, we actually sat there, and with every wave that came in, I had a sifter. Mm-hmm. And it would be full of plastic with yeah. every wave. And you're, you're almost in like, how long am I going to sit here? Just, right. And it's the small stuff. And people are still glorious with those big trophies of giant plastic that they carry. But it's the small stuff. That much small stuff is coming with every single wave to our yeah. island. So we have to figure out what to do. And right now while we're talking, I know Greenpeace is doing a beach cleanup. Yes, right now. Right now. So in the wildlife refuge as we speak. So, so that's very exciting. We're doing, they're there where I was just a couple of months ago doing the same thing. But we've got to, I think, as you point out, go to the spigot. Yes. Turn that spigot off, the corporate yes. spigot. And most importantly, make the connections because it does get exactly to your point of health. Yeah. That eventually it's our health that will be impacted. And we have to think of it two ways. The health of our bodies, the health of nature, and then also, mm -hmm. as you pointed out, if you eat fish. Right. So the Which... point is, everything in the food chain mm -hmm. is also mm -hmm. gobbling that up. And so eventually those plastics and in our health system have huge consequences. And so I think people have to think of it, like you said, with the money aspect of you're going to now pay 15 cents for a bag, and people are like, oh, no, I can't believe I'm spending money, to, oh, my goodness, it's impacting my health, to if you can think of the others, like how our earth and yeah. Hawaii and how beautiful it is and how that's being changed by plastic. Yeah, definitely. And thank you for actually answering the question. I went off on a tangent. I didn't no. actually say. It was actually important. But it's sort of pathetic, right? I mean, we're like, which water, which salt is better? I mean, how sad that, we, that we've gotten to this point where we're asking ourselves, okay, which water can I drink that doesn't have plastic in it? I mean, how ridiculous, right? Just these unforeseen consequences of, you know, convenience and delivering our you know delicious coca-cola bottles too much i mean it's just look at where look at where we are now it's yeah. just it's really wild so no i mean and and there is no one way out so i think greenpeace's aspect of we're looking at legislation the the exciting short videos get you yes. to think about things that then brings about small change in how we do on a daily basis with our daily decisions of what we yes. consume and how we live Absolutely. and then the petitions but then also election is coming up. We're less than a yes. month out. We have the midterm elections coming up. So that's a huge point. And if you looked at the Sunday talk shows, mm -hmm. there was some discussion about the IPCC report and the people holding those top administrative posts couldn't respond. That's and we're definitely scary. in the wrong administration when we only have 12 years left to think where we're going. So the, the regarding plastics, regarding climate change, when you hear them respond, it shows that we, the people, have to definitely take actions to yes. change the direction of our democracy in that way. Yes. It's a lot of, again, just more convenient thinking of, you know, climate change is a hoax. Like, wouldn't that be great if that was true? It would be so easy. But it's just, it's just not true. There's just, you know, there's so many narratives that we're, that we're told. And, yeah, it's very it's difficult to confront them, but again, we need people who who really are taking this stuff seriously and who can represent us and get us out of you know, well, avert complete <laughs> climate catastrophe. Complete catastrophe at this point. Um, yeah, and definitely good to tie it back to the midterms. And then very, the very image timely. I think we just saw. There's only one building left at one of the beaches for an entire city, and it was just the house that the person built to try to survive. Oh my gosh, because and the of sea rest, level rise. 
Yeah, and the storm and everything that happened with the hurricane. So mm. the velocity of the winds, yeah. the sea level rise, the after flooding, there's just no one is able to match the power of nature. Right. And she wins. She wins every time. <laughs> she wins every time. Absolutely true. So it looks like Sarah has maybe one more question. I see you leaning forward, and we definitely want to include mm -hmm. you. Yes? Well, actually, I'm good. I was just I was kind of stretching a little bit. <laughs> but I do okay. want to say thank you. That was a really nice talk. And yeah, it was really informational. And it definitely, I was actually just thinking of ways I can incorporate this for my uh, student teaching or when I do become a teacher because I feel like it's one way to get students actually take action rather than just sitting in school and learning. So yeah, like this talk actually um, got me thinking about some projects in the future already. So yeah, I just awesome. want to say thank you Yay. for Love answering my questions. So that was really informational. So yeah, thank no, you wait. so much. Mm -hmm. We think it'll be great for you as an educator as well. And we got a couple of short mm -hmm. videos about the IPCC report. Okay. And the important thing is it talks about the 1.5 level. And that's the level where we have to keep, especially here for the Pacific. So we're looking mm -hmm. at Tuvalu, mm -hmm. Kiribati. It's an existential threat. It's the end of life as is known and end even of the islands which they've inhabited since time immemorial. So here's some short videos to explain the IPCC 1.5. And we just want to be able to let you see that. The IPCC is the world's most authoritative voice when it comes to climate change science. And it's just released a new report into 1.5 degrees of warming. And it's a really big deal. The report shows us exactly what's at stake. The difference between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees of warming is really significant. We've already seen the damage that 1 degree can do. The impacts get exponentially worse and every fraction of a degree is going to matter. Reason number two. This report lends even more legitimacy to our demand to keep fossil fuels in the ground. The science is really clear. Any hope of a safe climate hinges on stopping fossil fuel expansion immediately. And given what the science is telling us, any support for the fossil fuel industry is completely morally and scientifically indefensible. And reason number three, and this is probably the most important one, it's created a rare moment where the world is talking about climate change. We know that these opportunities don't come along very often. And if there's one thing that this report tells us, it's that we can't afford to miss opportunities. The science just couldn't be clearer. You're either on the side of climate action or you're on the side of the fossil fuel industry. Totally terrifying. Definitely uh, one thing we have to consider. And there was uh, one more report that uh, CNN covered real quick. So mm. they're, they're looking at for two minutes. We can look at that. About climate change, and it is not positive, to say the least. And you're going to break it down for us. Yeah, it is not positive. I mean, it just keeps getting uh, worse. Urgent transformational change. That is the headline. That is what we're talking about. That's what needs to happen for us to really make a difference here. And we're not just talking um, uh, unspecifics. We're going to nail down the numbers here because they got very specific in this right. report. I've been reading through it. Let's head over here and uh, talk about this. Uh, the inter intergovernmental panel on climate change that's who put out the report and I tell you what um, we have been of course talking about the evidence that is already there so this is not something folks that we have to wait 10 20 50 years it's happening right now the additional floods we're getting the storms that are stronger the droughts that are more long-lived and last for years and years and years each event can be attributed to climate change but boy they are going to become more frequent and more intense as the planet warms up and it has continued to warm up before we started you know making things right the industrial revolution can you see the blue line that entire blue line about 1900 present that basically <laughs> represents a degree celsius of warming across the entire planet that's how much we've warmed the planet one degree now this is what we're talking about here with this report 1.5 Celsius. That is the goal that we're trying to get to, trying to limit the planet so that it doesn't warm above that, because if it does, we're really going to be in trouble. So what does that mean? That means that by 2030, CO2 emissions, we've got to cut that by 45 percent, and by 2050, by 100 percent. So essentially, we have to become carbon neutral. Sourcing 
electricity, 70 to 85 percent from renewables by 2050. And then we have to put a price. This is the one folks don't like to talk about on greenhouse gases. It's going to cost money, right? And so this is what we've been talking about. This is why we have these accords. And this is why this is a worldwide event that uh, all nations have to contribute to this uh, number below 1.5. Because as I said, if it goes above that, it really starts wreaking havoc even more so across uh, the planet. Tough stuff. Tough stuff for us, for nature. Big things, yes. without a doubt. Josh and I were just saying it's very, what, what a coincidence that since the Industrial Revolution has started, we've warned the planet 1% producing all sorts of plastic crap that we don't need. It's so, so true. So, very, an urgent transfer, transformational change, I think, is the most important point. Definitely. And speaking of change, you can see some of that change happening at the UN. Michelle Bachelet was the former president of Chile and also the head of UN Women. So she was just sworn in as the new high commissioner. And here's her perspective on her job and her role. It's a great role. honor uh, to become high commissioner on human rights. Um, I see this as one of the most important jobs uh, in, at the international level. I think the mandate which is to protect and uh, promote human rights um, in, in, to everyone, everywhere. It's daunting, but it's vital. I understand the victims and defenders of uh, human rights are looking at me to ensure the rights, and, uh, and I'm ready for the challenge. Uh, on the other hand, this year, we will, on December the 10th, we will have the celebration of the 70th anniversary of the Declaration of Universal Human Rights. And I think that was a very important document on the wake of Second World War. And um, like my predecessor, I'll do my utmost to be able to ensure that that uh, Declaration of Human Rights will be a reality for everyone, everywhere in the world. All right, so a short video, but a very powerful one to uh, look at the work of what she's doing. The other videos we have are a little bit longer. They were looking at Prime Minister of Fiji and also the Prime Minister of Tuvalu, but we'll look at those later as well as the Social Good Summit. Social Good Summit was an exciting time where a lot of people came together and you can see right there, it's the 2030 now. And if you're looking at that issue, that's the big challenge of what can we do. And if you look at that, we can uh, bring it up. One of the things that we're able to do when we're in New York at the General Assembly was a thing called Global Goals Jam. So it actually was a project designed by actually engineers of all people in Amsterdam, University of Amsterdam, to get people to have the conversations like you're talking about in your classroom in the future. Because if you look at the global goals, the first seven are all about economic, social, and cultural rights that we all need to live a good way and to also protect our planet. And then the next ones are looking at consumption and how we live. And 13, 14, 15 are climate change, life below water, and life on land. And then 16 is peace and justice, and 17 is partnership. So the global goals, in a way, is the 2030, can we meet these goals by then? And of course, that links into the IPCC report, that we have to transform the way we live and what we do, because if we don't, there'll be huge consequences and really no one can escape, mm -hmm. no matter how wealthy you are and wherever you live in the world, nope. we'll all be impacted with climate change. So there's a, a lot going on. Are there any final points you'd like to say or a message mm. to the people of Hawaii with your visit? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're just so excited to be here and it's really great to have such a warm welcome from everybody who's excited that we are here. And again, I think, you know, coming from the mainland, the things that we'll be doing, you know, going to this wildlife refuge, going to Holaves, uh, I'm getting even messages from folks who are seeing in real time, like the photos from the wildlife refuge. They're like, oh my God. Um, you know, just just traveling to a part of the world that really, uh, really is so integrated with nature, I think really helps us um, back on the mainland. Just, it puts it in perspective for us, you know, the impacts that you see in Hawaii. Um, it just, it's, it's just a little microcosm of what's happening all over the entire world. So, you know, 
this is going to sound extremely trite, but it's like we're coming here, you know, we're sharing our knowledge, we're teaching folks, and we're learning from you all with the energy, with with the things that we're seeing on the beaches. So it's just this incredible exchange of inspiration. Um, so we're all very, very excited to be here. So thanks so much for having me. No it's been problem. So great. Thank you for coming, and it's an honor to host Greenpeace. In fact, there's a big history with Greenpeace. Uh, Greenpeace Rainbow Warrior, the last place it was before it was fatally bombed for all the protesting against the nuclear testing. When it was bombed in New Zealand, it was at Koolave. So it's actually wow. great for Greenpeace to come home again Yes. before that. And then it's also great, uh, we're looking at October 29th on Monday evening. The Climate Change Commission is going to have a meeting at the Blaisdell Center, which is to get everybody together to look at the Rockefeller 100 cities looking at climate change and adaptation, mitigation, and resilience. But then we're also looking at showing the amazing film, How to Change the World on Monday night. So that'll be an exciting time that people can go and be on the deck. And it's a beautiful mm -hmm. place when the sun sets so nicely there that we could look at how to change the world together. And we look forward to inviting everyone to October 29th for the final day. And want to thank Greenpeace very much for coming to Hawaii. And also excited to hear about your trip to Maui. Yes. Because that'll be exciting yes. with the work there. And it's also an exciting time with the 70th anniversary of the UDHR. So mahalo and Thank you so much, Ciara, and we'll see everyone tomorrow because Thank there's you. an event tomorrow night on the boat that will be looking at uh, plastic pollution and combating climate change. Yes. All right, so mahalo, and mahalo. have a wonderful time, and we'll catch up with everyone Thank later. Thank you. <laughs> Aloha. Bye. Bye.